what's really the concern with stormwater? Why, you know, what, if, you know, is there really anything that we need to be worried about with it? What's the concern? And I'm sure most of you have personal stories and, you know, of situations where you've seen some of these things dumped into storm drains or direct connections that go to a stream, things like that. A couple of personal stories I have, uh, I'm a pretty big environmentalist. I grew up in a, a small farm town in northern Ohio. So I, I see, you know, a lot of people think farmers are the environmentalists, and I can tell you that that's not the case. It's usually just the opposite, um, including my father. Uh, he, I still try to get him to do things that he shouldn't be doing. Uh, one that he used to do, he told me back in the 60s and 70s, was literally pull his car up to a storm drain, let the oil right out, and be done with it. And now I'm here in that generation, that was a pretty common thing. So this is... You know, it, it's a pretty big problem. You add all these things up. It's a substantial. There's been a lot of studies done to show that stormwater pollution is pr probably one of the biggest polluters we have out there. So I'm not going to go through all these, but these are all different examples. So having said that, how is stormwater actually regulated? Um, a lot of regulation on that could be done through local health departments with open dumping complaints, things like that. But the storm sewer system itself there really wasn't a whole lot of regulation for that. So EPA, uh, when they formed, you know, back in the uh, early 70s, they kind of started to tackle different things as time went on. And stormwater was kind of at the, the back burner of it, but the Clean Water Act was, it's been amended several times, and actually in 1990, as part of the Clean Water Act, uh, they required a permit, it's an NPDES permit, so we've been talking a lot about those, you should be familiar with that. But they started big, kind of like they did with a lot of things. They started with what they call medium and large. Um, now this is a term I, I'm going to probably use throughout this presentation, so try to remember it. it's the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So what that is, that's the storm sewer system that you see like in the roads. It's the public infrastructure for the storm sewer system. That doesn't include private systems. Now, as we go through this presentation, what I'm starting to find, and I think the EPA is finding, is everything is connected to the MS4 because it includes discharges. And ultimately, especially in Hamilton County, if, you, if you're discharging a pipe into a stream, that stream's gonna go into the MS4. So more or less, this permit is a big umbrella for every discharge that hits the surface. So phase two, phase two kind of uh, got a little bit deeper and, and uh, branched out to the small <coughs> municipalities. So you can see um, that's municipalities, 100,000 population. That was, used to be the cutoff that they got rid of that. Um, it actually, so March 10, 2003, there was over 480 Ohio uh, local governments that had to get this stormwater permit. It's an NPDES permit. It's a large permit with a lot of different uh, controls and things in place, which we'll go through. The other thing I didn't talk about is and I probably won't focus too much on this because we don't do this, but construction disturbing. Obviously that puts a lot of sediment into the water, which is a major pollutant. And phase one, it was uh, five acres or greater. Phase two, they put it down to one acre um, or greater. And then of course, uh, industrial activities, they include a lot more industrial activities. So Hamilton County, we had a pretty big, uh, we have a lot of, uh, municipalities and townships down there, we had to decide what were we going to do. We have uh, 37 members uh, in our uh, the stormwater district, but there's actually 10 outside of that too. So you're essentially looking at 47 permits in Hamilton County alone. So we had to decide, well, how are we going to handle that? Do we want to create a stormwater district to where we oversee and help assist all these little uh, villages? And the townships actually fall under us anyway. But that's what we decided to do. We decided to create the stormwater district to help and fulfill the requirements of the permit. So we decided, how, how are we going to do that? Do we want to start a whole new staff? Um, and the answer was really no, because a lot of what's required, we're already doing. So uh, us, for example, we, we are out there, Hanson County Public Health, Hamilton County Soil and Water, they already do a lot of the soil management we were talking about on construction sites. Uh, Hamilton County Engineer's Office, um, Hamilton County uh, Department of Planning and Development. <clears throat> they oversee a lot of the controls and places that are put in after the construction's done. Um, so we basically said, why don't we do that to save taxpayers money? We'll create a stormwater district utilizing partner agencies and combine our services. 
And there's also a consultant as well, CDM Smith, the one there in the right hand corner. Uh, they are the ones who kind of oversee the program for us to make sure if the permit changes, uh, that we're fulfilling the requirements of that permit. Uh, they draw up the plans. Uh, they do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that we do not do. So like I said before, the permit actually is it's very long. It's, uh, it's very broad though. They didn't really know how to hit these uh, different things. So they broke it out into six what they call minimum control measures. And we'll go through those briefly, but the main thing I wanted you to see here is that uh, we, uh, Hamilton County Public Health pretty much does two of them. We oversee MCM3 and MCM6. And the majority of what I'm going to present to you is MCM3 and then uh, Kyle will present MCM6. So kind of going through this real quickly, um, minimum control measure number one is public education and outreach. And if we go back, Hamilton County Soil and Water does that. What that is, that's more or less the, uh, I call it the, the warm and fuzzy type things where you go into a school, you educate kids, uh, you know, you do ads, you do flyers, you know, you see billboards. That, those are all part of MCM 1 and 2 to where you're getting the public involved, you're educating the public, you're basically trying to get spread the word so like my dad's not dumping oil into the storm sewer system and all the other things. So MCM3, that's what I was talking about. Well, that's going to be the majority of what I talk about. That's illicit discharge detection elimination. Basically, that's trying to figure out all those illegal discharges that are happening, how do you get rid of them? How do you find a way to get rid of them, actually? Construction runoff, uh, Hamilton County Soil and Water. Post-construction soil and water, you know, planning and development, do that one. And good housekeeping, that's actually saying, if you have a permit, uh, if you're a village or a municipality, you better be following these things. So if you've got a county garage, you better not be dumping salt or things in your storm drain. And you'd be surprised some of the things that we saw when we started doing this. So MCM3, illicit discharge detection elimination. I guess the first thing you need to understand, what is an illicit discharge? Like I said, it's, I guess the best way to put it is, it's basically anything that's not stormwater that's getting into the uh, MS4. So in this case, you know, you got the, this, uh, out of salvage yard with all this equipment, you see all that sheen and everything running in there, that's an illicit discharge. There are some exceptions. Um, firefighting activities is an exception, uh, NPDES permit, so septic systems that have an NPDES permit, they are not an illicit discharge. Some other uh, examples of what is not, there's some exceptions, so like water line flushing, landscape irrigation, uh, Pool water. Uh, pool water actually is a pretty big one we deal with a lot. A lot of people just at the end of the uh, fall, they just discharge their pool water. And lots of times there's a drain right next door. But it has to be dechlorinated first. Because as most of you probably know, but chlorine in a, an environment is not good for the, the biology of that stream. I mean, Kyle and I look at these things all the time. We can tell when something's gone through there that shouldn't have gone through there. There's basically no, no animal life in there at all. So. Trying to figure out where these illegal discharges are, the first step, and the permit actually requires this, you have to be able to say where the MS4 even is. And I'll be honest with you, we don't know. I mean, some of it we have plans. A lot of stuff was put back in over 50 years ago. There's no record of it. So our first job, and it's requirement of the permit, you got to locate and map your entire MS4. <coughs> At Hamilton County, that's a big, big job. Trust me, that's a huge job. And uh, planning and development took on, they're the ones who kind of had a lot of the old information. They're the ones actually out mapping all of the uh, infrastructure in the right-of-way, the public right-of-way. So here, obviously, we have more staff here than normal. We were actually, that was a, a meeting we had to meet with their staff to see exactly what they do. Um, and I'll talk more about that later, because when they're out mapping, there's things they can be looking for that we need them to find. Um, but so you can see they're actually, they have a GPS unit and they are plotting uh, on the left hand side there, the actual uh, structures and on the, uh, they, they do it in a phase approach. They actually will plot the structure, then go back, pop the manhole, take measurements and uh, all the details of what's coming into that manhole. Then phase three, they actually put all the points together and map it. So what do we do? We actually, a lot of our infrastructure that we do at Public Health, of course, we're overseeing all the uh, septic systems. So 
This is the public infrastructure here, that blue line. A lot, as you can see, a lot of these holes actually tie right into the MS4. They drain in the collector line. So to give you an example, these homes here all drain to the backyard into a, what we call a collector line, and that goes directly into the storm sewer system in the road. So we uh, we have the authority, and we are, we're doing these uh, inspections already. We're actually, we have a mapping crew that goes out and maps the locations of all these systems. And that's actually what they're doing in these photos. So, and it's really, really neat. It's pretty cool equipment. I highly encourage you guys to take a look at what we have here. It's, I'll be honest with you, I'm super, super proud of what we have and what we do. Um, we have, no, we do, we have the best equipment that you can get GPS right now. That meter right there, that data collector will get within, what, about two centimeters? Two centimeters sub, accuracy. Sub centimeter. Sub centimeter. So, and that's, a, it'll do elevation too. So, Holly, Highway EPA, it, it has applications in other fields too, for landfills, different things. But we can plot that exactly where that's located. So even if they cover up that structure later down the road, we know exactly where that structure was if we plot it when we're out there. So our goal is we're plotting all these structures. So in the, the photo there to the right, that's a system. We're actually mapping uh, different components. You can see the gentleman there bending over. He's actually taking depths. So we're, we're actually attributing all this information too. We're not just going out and plotting the point. We're saying exactly what's there. We're saying what type of lid it is. We're saying how deep the system is there. We're saying what, if it's a pipe, what color the pipe is, the diameter. We know exactly what that pipe does. So I guess going back to this, the main thing to understand here is so it goes into the public infrastructure. And you can see right there, that dot actually says CL outfall. That's a collector line outfall. Do you see where that starts? That starts to it into a stream. So, like I said, we're finding out the MS4 is everywhere. And a couple of other things, kind of stepping back, you know, I said that we do MCM3, which is illicit discharge detection, and MCM6. We do other things too, and that's part of being a partner agency, we found a lot of successes. When we're out literally going door to door, knocking on people's doors to uh, GPS or septic system, we can stick these door tags on their door. And that fulfills part of MCM1, where we're educating the public. So, uh, you know, basically it's just a, do you notice anything fishy going on with your drains? Do you see any dumping? It's got our hotline number on there. So that encourages people to basically blow the whistle on other people when they see it. Most people do want to do the right thing. They either just don't know or they don't know what their options are to report it. So that's just another way that we found we could do that. So how, how do we find these illicit discharges? The easy approach is to be reactive. And that's kind of what the permit says right now. You have to do certain things. So uh, reactive type things are outfall observations where it literally, the permit says you have to go walk your streams with Kyle Dexter over there. He'll be up here soon. He did, a, he did that with, uh, how, how many long did it take you, Kyle? Two years? Three years? Yeah, three years. Three years. I think he found, what, over 8,000 outfalls? 8,400. 8,400 outfalls. So the permit required us to go out and plot each of those outfalls in the streams. But how in the heck do we know where they're coming from and what they are? You know, that permit doesn't tell you. It doesn't say that this is what you do. They kind of leave it up to you. You know, if you're in some little county, you may only have a few of them, but we, we got a lot of outfalls. So, of course, the citizen reporting, the hotline number, uh, spill response and cleanup. Those are all reactive approaches. I'll give you some examples. So here's the map. Uh, you can see the, the members that aren't part of the district are whited out, but the city of Cincinnati is whited out as well. They're a member, but they do their own mapping. Um, but there they are. So you can see, I mean, like Kyle said, over 8,400 of them. So kind of stepping back, what we've done, without getting into I could give you a whole presentation on this, how we've labeled each of those outfalls. You know, you, you can do it by color, you can do it by odor. There's so many different things you can do. And we tried to do all that when Kyle was out doing the mapping. Some easy ones, I mean, there to the left, you can, there's a problem there. That was an actual laundromat facility that all their wastewater was going directly into that problem culver pipe and going down to the street. Um, the one there to the right, the photo doesn't do justice, but the odor was just unbearable. And that was straight uh, building sewer pipe coming from an apartment building. And, and the fire department. Yeah, we won't say what jurisdiction, but it was an actual, right. the fire department and their admin building, they were discharged. How long was it after Kyle? We had yet? Forever. Until so, I, until I found it. So, no, the 
first round of looking at these outfalls with successful findings, but we're, talk, we're talking uh, you know, a handful out of eight, over 8,000 outfalls. Other ones, there's a glue discharge there to the left. Uh, that was a manufacturing facility where they, they thought their uh, floor drain went to sanitary sewer. Of course it did. The other thing, keep in mind, these are all intermittent. You know, we, we're not out there all the time, so we can't see these things that they're occurring. Sewage. Um, like I said, citizen reporting. I kind of just threw this up here to give you an idea. Um, I don't want to get into why the numbers the way they are, but you know, we're averaging around 400 complaints a year that are stormwater related. And we, of course, we respond to all those complaints. Um, you know, some of the, the real good success stories that we've had with complaints. This is a uh, uh, septage hauler who was actually Sam Manhole in his backyard. He was taking his pipe into the day, and that's where it went. It wasn't one MSD. He wasn't registered with us. Um, without getting into any litigation or anything like that, we took care of the situation, but this is what the outfall looked like here. A lot of, lot of very disgusting things in that. Uh, another typical one, this was actually, believe it or not, I, we found the, the culprit who did this. Uh, a lady just had to notice in her neighborhood, she called us, and if you look, part of the, uh, Permit requires that you start water labeling. That right there, that's that. The guy literally just dumped it almost right on top of the label, said not to dump. And it was a painter. It was an actual painting company who was doing it. I found them. Of course, oh, we worked on that. But uh, so and you can see what the outfall looks like there. But that's another one that you're not going to catch while you're out actually doing the outfall unless you're there the day that he did it. And this is one that we just got this year, um, over, over applying fertilizer. This is what you get, blue-green algae outbreak. Um, it's actually, it's a cyanobacteria, so it's not, it's not an algae, but uh, you know, we had to have them poke this. I don't have it in the photo here, but this, there's a walking trail that went right next to this, and there's actually a playground right here, too. This was a, real, a brand new subdivision, um, and you know everybody wants their grass to look nice and green, so all that over application was going directly in there. So what can I do? I went out. Um, we notified all the homeowners. We notified the uh, what was the word I'm looking for? The uh, the maintenance company who oversees the subdivision. Uh, thank you, homeowners association. They came out. They're, they're the ones who did all the treatment, uh, posted the signs. We uh, I contact all the local vets in the area to make sure they knew because if a dog went down there and drank that, he'd become uh, finally ill and probably die. Um, so it's, this was kind of a newer thing, but this is part of, of stormwater as well. Uh, some other reactive things we've seen in the south. We got a complaint actually down in this stream. Chris Walster was the first responder to this. Chris, remember this one? Yeah. Um, they, somebody actually just, it was actually uh, a city employee who said that they noticed a slight sheen in the water. We went up, uh, bring it from there, and that's what we found. Breaking down vehicles without any cover. Uh, this, you already saw this photo. These are all engines and transmissions and everything. And you can see that it's kind of hard to see, but that's literally automotive fluid running right there off the site. And I don't have it here in the photos, but they had a drain right here. Straight pipe drain to, the, to this stream. Straight pipe drain from here, and this was a straight pipe drain as well. So uh, got the EPA involved with that, Chris Cotton. Uh, so that's the nice thing. We, we already have the resources. We know what to do with these complaints. I mean, you guys probably deal with, with wastewater complaints and things too. It's a little bit outside of our box, but it's very similar. And uh, you know, if a little town or a village has to do this on their own, do you think they're gonna be able to know what to do in these situations? I mean, that, that's the advantage that we bring as a stormwater district. Uh, field investigation is just typical guide. Actually, this, this photo here is from that salvage yard. So that was a uh, trench, that one there to the, the left. Um, that's not the, the culvert where it came out, but that's, you know, these are typical dye tests that we do. And I have several things set up here if you want to take a look at different tools and things that we use to do our investigations. The photo down here to the, the right is actually not our truck, but we just, it literally was supposed to be in this week. We have a water truck that's going to assist us with uh, um, doing dye testing. So we can flush water through a system and locate where, where the discharge is going. Other tools we have, like I have most of it here. Now keep in mind, none of it has been, everything I've brought I think does not go in contact with wastewater, so you're safe there. All the stuff that comes in contact, I left at the office. But the video monitor, the uh, camera equipment, the locator there, um, those are all different tools that we have here at the public health to help find where these things are coming from. 
So there at the, at the right, we had a, it's a manhole. We couldn't figure out. We knew sewage was coming in. And we could not figure out where it was coming from. So we basically were able to run a camera up through there with a the locator. And the gentleman, oh, this gentleman up here is actually locating where the, the, uh, the end of the camera is. And we, we thought it was coming from homes with septic systems. We died past them and it never showed up. So it's kind of an interesting one, but essentially it was a, a leaky sewer pipe following the uh, gravel conduit and the um, around the pipe. Finding its way all the way down to there's a vault up here. And in that vault, there was a, uh, an overflow pipe that drained down to this manhole. But without those tools, we would have never found that. Even if we would have dye tested that vault, it would have taken days. And the, the dye would have been so minute, we would have never seen it. So th these tools are very, very handy, and we've been able to locate a lot of, a lot of uh, illicit discharges that way. This is another tool. This is an actual camera. If you have this here as well, um, you can zoom in and see. It's got a real bright light. You can actually see down inside of the uh, the pipes. Spill response. Uh, this, believe it or not, this was a grape juice spill, which sounds like, oh, grape juice, that's good. Well, not in the stream, it's not. It'll kill everything. So uh, we basically, whatever we uh, come in contact, the good thing is, and I'll talk about it, people call us now. When these things happen, we know about them most of the time. So we can oversee and make sure it gets reported properly. This one just literally happened last month. So this was a success story where the jurisdiction knew it was citizen called their um, local representative. The local representative, we trained them, they needed to call us. So we responded to it. Kyle was the first one out there for me. And uh, this is what he found. So first question is, what the heck's going on here? This can't, like I said, there's no odor or anything, obviously, with the photo. But this is actually like petroleum here. And this is all heavy staining. And this was, you know, after the leaves had just fallen, so there was staining all over these leaves. Not on the photo, but there was an actual black uh, surface coating inside that copper pipe. But we, we ended up, um, we called in Ohio EPA and assisted them with the investigation, and we found this was the call group. So, of course, we went to the facility. Oh, no, no, we don't store anything here. Oh, well, yeah, we do have, uh, well, we do have a little uh, tank back there. We went back, everything looks good. Well, can we take a look back here in the back? There was product everywhere. And, uh, Dale Farmer, I don't know if any of you know Dale Farmer. Dale was showing me, he said this was definitely a spill, and he was showing me all the different things to look for with the spill. But uh, they had a major release here, and this is what resulted. So in the end, they had to pump. If this was an asphalt sealing company. They had to go down and pump all this water out of the stream. What did they do with the water? Um, a good question. They, did everybody hear what did they do with the water? Uh, they had to evaluate it, and they determined that it was safe to go to MSD for treatment. So they literally pumped it out and went straight into a manhole with a sanitary sewer. So those are all reactive approaches. You know, you're, you're reacting to the problem after it's already happened. So we kind of sat down and started looking at the successes we had. And we said, well, what, why are we spending all this time and effort to try and go out to these outfalls when it's you know, sporadic anyway? How can we be proactive to try and find these problems? Um, and getting into the outfalls again, you know, we gave you that over 8,000 outfalls. The permit said you're supposed to go out every five years and look at all of those outfalls. So we're like, we don't even have the manpower or the resources to do that. And, you know, we have some of them out there where there might be an odor associated. So we were out sampling. I mean, we were blowing through money like nothing when it came to sampling. So we basically took an approach and said, why don't we prioritize these outfalls? And this, I know you can't read it, but this kind of shows you we have a modeling program in place, and CDM Smith was the one who put this together to where they can take each of these outfalls and we have a weighted scale based on high risk areas. So if it's sewer, if it's not sewer, if we've had a high number of complaints there, what type of land use it has. So each year we're getting a priority list now where we go out and we look at these outfalls. And we're actually screening them. So rather than take them to an analytical lab to have them sample, we're using screening tools. So I don't know if any of you have seen these, these tools. I'm new, I've done sampling for years, but I've never used the stormwater test kit. Uh, but this will actually give you detergents, chlorine, copper, and phenols. And then we have a, uh, an actual meter. This, you know, it's a typical meter, but it just temperature, pH, conductivity, nit nitrates is a big one, and DO. So we can get an idea if these outfalls are a problem based on that. The other one, this is a proactive approach, and we've already talked about it today at the other uh, presentations, but Hamilton County, I'm sure most of you are aware, 
my opinion, I mean, we have one of, if not the best, uh, O and M plans in the state of Ohio. We've been doing this since the '90s, and this kind of gives you some of the numbers for it. But that's a proactive, uh, that's a proactive approach, and we we basically should be proud of that. And I, it's, it legitimizes what we do for stormwater too, because each of those that aren't NPDES permitted are kind of an illicit discharge. So as you can see, we have uh, over 18,000 systems. Um, we already mentioned it, we do our mechanicals annually, we do our non-mechanicals every five years. We have, I think what created, we had 16, you said, discharging systems. We have over 13,000 discharging systems in Hamilton County. So you can imagine the logistics and the, uh, a lot of our technicians are here, so good work guys. I mean, I know they don't get a lot of, Kevin Hawkins has been doing this, how many years, Kevin? 19. 19 years. So these guys do a lot of hard work, and the good thing is the homeowners know us. They know us. So we're not actually GPS and doing the stormwater work. They pretty much everybody lets us on their property. It's not a problem because they're used to seeing us anyway. But uh, we also were very aggressive with our repairs, uh, replacements, and forcing people to connect to the sanitary sewer. What are some of the things we see? I mean, you guys have probably seen these. I like that one there to the left because it's a playground. The, the green is we die tested it, so that's what the green is. But the, there to the right, you can see the retaining wall with the, uh, the sewage coming out of the retaining wall. Just typical uh, orders that we give to either repair or connect to a sewer if they're accessible. This is kind of hard to understand, but the main thing to get with this, I just threw out the last three years. Uh, we, If you look at the number, what that's essentially saying is we issued we either issued a repair order uh, to connect a sewer or to replace the system over 9,000 of those in the last three years. That's that's major. That's eliminating a lot of these pollutants that are getting into the stormwater runoff. And some of the program outcomes, you know, homeowners are educated. I think I heard somebody mention earlier, you know, they didn't even know. Oh, I didn't even know I had that. Most of our homeowners hopefully do. You know, if it's a new owner who bought it, they may not know, but. Our inspectors will actually uh, assist them and show them, if, if they're willing, to uh, you know how things operate. Dan Burke, he's probably one of our best at that. Dan. Uh, priority areas. We also we have obviously areas where it, it's very condensed and we have a high volume of systems or maybe the age of the system. So we can evaluate high priority areas versus areas that maybe aren't having as much pollution. Um, so part of the proactive approach, we talked about MCM6, we're actually going out to all these government facilities and meeting and training the uh, facilities crews, the roads crews. So we're like, why in the world are we telling those people to be looking for these problems? You know, if I got somebody in uh, Addison that sees on a routine basis this outfall, they're going to know when there's a problem before I know. So we basically are encouraging these individuals to call us when they see a problem. And I kind of mentioned it, Kyle talk more about this, but you know, their own facilities, I mean, you can see the issue there with the salt right next to a storm drain and how it's spilling out where the drones are stored. But like I said before, these, these guys see way more than we can on a routine basis. Uh, we do windshield surveys, so whenever somebody's on, on you know, route to a a field inspection, if they see something like this, this is an illicit discharge. And this, I'll tell you, this is a very, very common illicit discharge that happens all the time, concrete salt. How often do you see somebody with a concrete salt capturing that water? Almost never. I mean, before coming to the public health, I worked seven years in this type of industry, we never pump that water. But it shouldn't be going into a storm drain because that goes right to the stream. Now this was a huge success uh, as part of the uh, education, we said, why don't, why are we, okay, we're educating the government facilities, why aren't we educating our own people? Why aren't we, you know, we have restaurant inspectors out there, we have uh, hotel, people checking hotels, schools, landfills. You know, I literally sat down with each of our divisions and said, look, I want you guys out there looking for these things and these are the problems to look for. So here's some of the, the pictures of successes we've had, and these are just within the last year, dumpsters. Dumpsters are a major, major problem. I didn't even realize that until our restaurant inspector started sending me photos. Look at those dumpsters. That all goes directly into a storm drain. One of these dumpsters, I, I didn't have a photo of it, it literally, whatever was coming out of that dumpster was eating the concrete away. Going right down to a stream. 
We've had streams, we couldn't figure out what was going on, an outfall. We traced it up, guess what it was? The dumpster. A lot of these dumpsters at grocery facilities, they compact it to save space, money, time. That juice, those dumpsters aren't usually watertight, poly. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, the, the good thing is, I'm targeting businesses now. I know where these problems are, so I can focus on, say, Kroger. I know Kroger has a lot of these dumpsters. I can go to their management and give them the tools to say, look, this is what you need to do. Maybe you need to pick it up more often. Maybe Rumpy needs to come out and check your dumpster. Maybe it shouldn't be leaking. So these are successes that we've just encountered within the last year of communication between our own uh, public health employees. Compost facilities, the leachate that runs off on, on those sites. You can see what it's one of that grass right there. Yes, Holly, I probably took a couple of those pictures myself. I, I Holly, she's from EPA, and she used to be my uh, auditor. I was I did uh, waste management for five years, so a lot of these pictures are actually, this was a picture that I took. Um, landscaping businesses, uh, they a lot of the, what they store, they basically, like you can see the salt pile right there, no cover on it. This is compost and soil, and this is a nice brine mixed with uh, leachate from the compost and you can imagine what that does. And this right here in the background, that's a major scenic river in Hamilton County. In fact, this is the same site. These are piles of, of uh, topsoil compost. Right there's the river right there. Plumbing division. Um, our plumbers are looking for gray water dischargers. Here's a gray water discharge to the road. Here's one in the backyard. I mean, these are common things, but they need to be letting us know about them. <coughs> Pool inspections, common thing you see with that, they always have storm drain. Almost none of those storm drains go into sanitary sewer. Uh, they usually store their chemicals like right here. So guess what that drum leaks? The other thing is backwashing too. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I've seen an opportunity maybe we need to go out and uh, educate pool maintenance companies where they backwash all that material. Landfill, same thing, leachate, where's the leachate going? And then just other typical complaints, you know, cars. I've got way worse photos than this. I just, it's what I had at the time. And I don't think this is about where you're going to take over. So what, what Kyle's going to talk about is MCM6. So going back, well, I'm not going to go back, but basically the permit, like I said, is broken down into six minimum controls. The last one we fulfilled completely for them. And what that says is that uh, you need to educate your own staff and you need to have uh, spill plans and things available so you're not breaking what the permit says you need to do. So Kyle actually, he's my, my go-to guy for education. Kyle goes out to these facilities and actually sits down sits down with the crews and educates them, goes through a PowerPoint similar to what we're doing right now. We show videos. Earlier, Brad was talking about how many systems we have in uh, Hamilton County. And I think it's good to bring up actually how many highly skilled guys we have actually working for Hamlet County Public Health. And if you guys would raise your hands, I'd like to, to talk to you. Uh, Kevin Hawkins, 19 years inspecting septic systems. Dan Burke, we've got five years, six years in inspecting. We've got Dave Ellert, who uh, does the site reviews and site plan reviews and uh, things like that. we got uh, Ed Conkey back there, does the non-mechanical inspections. A lot of experience there, probably 15, 14, 15 years in. Got Kevin King, does all of our nuisances. Got uh, Ryan Weiss, who is our GPS data collector and GIS editor, along with me. And Ryan Sheldon right there, and he does the inspection on septic system. So we have a lot of experience in our uh, in our health department. So take it, you know, while, while they're here, talk to them. Get what you can out of them. All right, I, uh, I've been doing these inspections on uh, facilities for since 2010, uh, doing the training and everything, and uh, it is NCM6, pollution prevention and good housekeeping. In 2010, the first thing we did was go out to the facilities and get them acquainted with this plan. This plan that requires them to basically walk through for their facility uh, on paper. It makes them write it down, look at it. Uh, it includes uh, maps, 
so they know where their floor drains are, where the, all their uh, catch basins are, and everything like that. So, so when they're doing their storage of all their liquids and things like this, they are uh, doing it strategically, making sure that it's not near the floor drains or it's not near the catch basins. So that's what they did in 2010. That was that was our training, and that's what we did to get them to uh, look at this plan and understand that they have to update it yearly. It all, and as I said, you've got your floor drains. It goes walks you through the whole part of your, of your whole facility, and it just goes through it, and you look at every part of it, where your oil is stored, all those things where your salt is stored, uh, whether you have roofs over it, whether you have spill kits, and so on and so forth. It, it's all spelled out in that plan and makes you focus and look at that. Uh, here's a perfect example right here. Uh, these barrels are stored outside. They have no protections around them. And they're sitting right over a catch basin. So we had a talk with them. We said, maybe we could do better than that. You know, maybe we could make sure that somebody doesn't run into these and they, they spill right into the catch basin, right in the creek. So the solution was, Get them up on these uh, trays so that any leaks and things will go into the trays and clean those out now and again. Uh, make sure they're protected. I'm not necessarily happy with the tires all around it, but in general the picture. And put some uh, controls just to make sure that you don't run into it. And keep it away from those, those uh, floor drains and things that, that uh, you identify through the plan and looking at the map and seeing where all those things are. And you can do a lot of strategic planning to limit the uh, impacts of your, of your facility. The other part of this, so in, 2000, in 2012, and we did skip 11, if you notice that, we just, 11, we weren't sent out to do this in, in 2011. But in 12, we stayed with the VMPs, the, the video there on the left, that's, it uh, specifically talks about VMPs, best management practices you can put in place at your facility to limit your impact on the streams and things around you. And so that was in 2012. We also went through the plan and actually implemented some of the BMPs, the, the uh, uh, spill kits and things like this, and made sure that those were in place. In the 2013, this year, we had the IDD, the uh, List Discharge Detection and uh, Elimination. So we, that's where Brad was speaking earlier. We went in and we actually helped ask them for their help. You guys are in the field, your eyes and ears and noses are out there in the field. And we gave them a, a phone number, 9467000, for them to call us and let us know uh, if they see any kinds of uh, discharges or dumping or anything like that. Uh, all of them, the more eyes and ears and people out there that see this and know who to call, the better off we're going to be. And we actually found some problems. And, and, and some of these facilities. And uh, on the left there, they were washing out their their uh, uh, pumper truck, the vac, vac truck, to go and clean the catch basins out and everything. They were cleaning it and dumping it right into their own catch basins. Well, the managers know now to look for those things and make sure they're not going on. And then in the, in some of it is old infrastructure. On the right here, this garage, uh, Long fridge drain down the middle there. Uh, that actually discharges to the storm sewer. And luckily, it does go through a separator first, but it dis discharges to the storm sewer. So they're going to be taxed by going through their plan. They're going to have to, they're going to go through their plan and indicate how they're going to deal with that situation, what they're going to do. Everybody knows money doesn't grow on trees, so it's going to be a process. We took it to council in 2013. They approved it for five years down the road that we can actually come up with the money to fix it. Those kinds of things are what the EPA is looking at in that plan to see that they're approaching this logically and trying to get these things fixed. So we're not going in there and hammering them right off the bat, but they have to document that so that the EPA can see that they have a plan to eliminate that discharge. Situation we really ran that, that really is crazy. <laughs> If you don't use your salt, okay, you have a mild winter, and you don't use your salt, you're still going to get your delivery the next year. So you can see on the left there, that dome is packed completely full. You couldn't get another grain in there. And they had to take the other delivery. They had no choice. It's their contract. They have to do it. 
And so now they have to put a cover over it. And of course, all the rain, you know, the, it's washing it off and crystallizing and going in the storm sewer. Tough on that creek. That creek's not very far from there. It's really hard on it. Also, we, we discussed through the plan, it's, it's part of the plan, going through the different appendices in the plan. It talks about signage. It talks about uh, preventing spills, what to do in that situation. Um, emergency, know where that, that button is to stop it. If something happens, the cop pulls away and the, and the uh, uh, nozzle falls out and spits all over the ground. Um, do not pour people down the stream if they sink. Uh, the phone number, again. And uh, soil, wa uh, soil water gets, a, gets this beautiful pamphlets here. We make sure that those are in the lobbies so that those are there for people to see them and take them and look at them. And uh, more awareness is the objective here. Back to your thing on the salts, in case folks don't know, the, the state did put together some best practices and guidelines for salt storage. You know, we've had you know, you don't, there's been major issues in the state with salt getting into the groundwater yeah. and completely, you know, we've had it in Provo County where Camden lost all of their uh, water supply because of salt infiltrating into their, their aquifer and Springfield is having the same type of issue. So they did have meetings last couple of years to tell people what's the proper way to store, you know, road salt. Yeah, you're 100% you're right. We actually, I mean, this is a permit that's not going away. And EPA is, uh, they, they, they audit it, and there, are, there have been municipalities that have gotten fined on this throughout the state. I'm sure you don't want to find it. But we just got audited uh, within the last couple of weeks, and the big thing they hit with is exactly what you're talking about, salt. They wanted to see, they wanted to know how much salt people were using. They wanted to know what the cover. That was a very big, big and Kyle hit it dead on. We, we see this problem throughout Hamilton County. I mean, two winters ago, we didn't have a snowstorm. And, you know, this is a problem we didn't know existed. That salt's coming whether you want it or not. So, you know, we're looking at our training now is kind of maybe focusing on salt next year. How can we help these uh, government facilities to manage salt in a better way? And bottom line, that's going to save them money. So if they can apply salt differently to where they don't have to apply as much salt, they're going to see numbers at the end of the year. That's that's what people want to see too. So you're you're definitely right on that the salt is a major issue with how EPA right now. It, it, it really is. It's something they're very aware of, and uh, we're researching. We're looking at it. We're trying to find ways that we can actually suggest and help and come up with some good BMPs uh, in that for that situation. Uh, it, it's successes and, and improvements. Um, floor drains connect to the sanitary sewer. Um, mostly they block them, but some of them have, have, have actually been tied in. Uh, some of them are still waiting. It's expensive, <coughs> but we we'll work on it. And we have to have plans on how, how to get that done. Spill kits, I was amazed how few spill kits were out there. Uh, we trained them on how to strategically place those spill kits for the larger spill. So you got a 55 gallon drum of oil, you want a pretty good size spill kit there. You know, if it's just leaking fluids coming out of the cars, you know, you're fine with the dry up method. Uh, so very few spill, spill kits out there, but they are, they are prevalent now. There's many of them and they're, they're well placed. Uh, the signage, I think I brought up the signage. Uh, plan, budgets, I, I brought up a lot of those things, uh, how they have to work through their budgets to correct some of these problems, uh, and increase improvement in communication with the members. I'll tell you, when we first started this, we got some real pushback. I mean, these people were setting their ways, and they, they, they didn't like people coming in and telling them what to do, or, or make some suggestions, and you know, we're the experts, and, and, and they are. They just need a little bit of direction. And by the time it was all said and done, because what we're really there for is to make sure that they stay in compliance with this NBDS permit. For them to make sure that they know what their requirements are, what they have to do. So at, this year I felt a lot more comfortable. I felt that they uh, understood my role and that I was not a regulator. I was, I was, uh, I was helping them to make sure that they, they could pass any kind of a, a, an audit. Uh, which we had an off this year, by the way, and uh, they did go out and inspect some of our facilities. And I think I heard it 
passed with white colors. We haven't got the official paper yet. We haven't got the official paper yet. <laughs> <laughs> verbally, we did very well. But verbally, we did very well. That's right. Uh, again, I, I spoke about the facility being more, more welcoming at this, this time around, more understanding. Uh, this has really made stormwater district and public health extremely visible out there. And uh, with all our trainings and all our staff people that we've got together and, and trained them on, on IDDE, uh, it's, it's really, really helped. And uh, as Brad talked about, we've gotten, we get a lot more complaints, more specific complaints. I know we've always gotten sewage complaints, always. You know, those are always there. But now we're getting those complaints that are intermittent discharges and dumpings that we would probably not have gotten if we hadn't been out there training these people and, and making sure they knew who to call and uh, to come out and try to figure out what it is and, and, and get it stopped. 